Right. Thanks for those who made the very last talk. I appreciate it. I'll try not to disappoint you very much. So uh, my name is Vasil Tarasov. I'm from Stony Brook University. And uh, this work was mainly done during my summer internship at IBM Research Almaden in collaboration with Dean Hildebrand from IBM, Jeff Kenning from Harvey Mudd College, and Eric Zadek from Stony Brook University. To begin with, let me describe to you a situation that will depict the problem that we are trying to tackle. So there are clients on one side and there are storage companies on the other side. All these storage companies are good, and you can see it from their names, fast storage, never fail, and so on. And the clients nowadays, they more and more often demand network attached storage. Every good company has one in its portfolio. And then the clients start, start to select the product for their environment. They look at the number of parameters, cost, reliability, and almost universally at performance. Traditional way to evaluate performance of NAS is to run some benchmark. So imagine that in this specific case, clients run a benchmark, and it turned out that Never Fails Corporation project is the best. So they happily buy it, install it, and start using. However, as time passes by, they start to be very disappointed because the performance that benchmarks predicted is much higher than what they observe in reality. So they start to come up with annoying nicknames for the companies, slow storage, epic fail, and so on. So the companies are not happy, clients are not happy, and an investigation starts. Why did, did it happen? And it turns out that the clients have migrated their applications from physical machines to virtual machines while the benchmarks still generate all the physical workloads. So the main goal of our study was to create new benchmarks for network attached storage that, uh, that are more accurate than nowadays benchmarks. The rest, of my uh, the rest of my talk is organized as following. First, I'll cover some background topics, then present our experimental setup, uh, characterize the workload, explain how we created the, the benchmarks, present their accuracy, and then finally conclude. So when you have an application running in a virtual machine, they usually, uh, they usually require file system interface, such as POSIX. And there are roughly two ways to provide such interface in the VM. One, you can use a distributed file system client within an OS. But uh, not every distributed file system client available for every OS. Another option is to emulate a block device in the hypervisor and, and then deploy an on-disk file system in the virtual machine. Within this option, there are four sub-options. A, you can keep a virtual disk image on a direct attached storage. This is the setup that you typically find on your laptop when you run VMware work Workstation. And clearly, it does not scale to larger deployments. deployments. Another approach is to keep a virtual disk image on some clustered file system, such as VMFS, on top of Sun. This is a more scalable approach, but it's kind of expensive and is not that easy to manage. Then you can keep virtual disk image on network attached storage, and I'll talk about it a little bit later. Finally, you can also create a pass-through uh, from a virtual machine directly to some physical device. And though this eliminates some of the overheads, um, this approach is not that flexible, for example, for virtual machine migration. So in this talk, and in this study, we focused on the VM NAS case, where virtual disk images are located on network attached storage. And I could talk more about advantages or disadvantages of this approach, but instead, I'll present to you a dry statistics. So according to IDC, but, but according to IDC by 2014, 90% of uh, shipped storage capacity will go into the network-based storage, and only 10% to the direct attached storage. And within the network-based storage, the growth of NAS is 60%, and of SAN is only 23%. The second trend is that uh, virtualization uh, becomes dominant. So according to Gartner, by 2014, 70% of the x86, x86 servers will be virtualized. So if we have two objects that are close nearby and they're extending, what happens? They eventually start to intersect. And we are targeting specifically this area in the middle that is constantly growing. Let me now look for the VMNAS IO stack. So you have an application that submits requests to a virtual file system for a system call interface usually. Virtual file system together with on-disk file system, uh, performance mapping, caching, coalescing, so modifies IO requests. 
Then the requests are passed to the block layer, and both block layer and the controller can reorder, and the controller driver can reorder, merge, and split requests. After that, controller emulator gets the, uh, performs certain operations on the requests. Right now, usually controller emulator doesn't change the request properties, but there are many proposals that some optimizations can be done uh, at this layer in the future. At this point, the request crosses the network, and both NFS client and NFS server can again uh, put certain constraints on their requests. Finally, the requests go through the same layers as above, but now already at NAS. And since the properties of the request have already changed and the optimizations applied at NAS are different, the final requests that reach the disk uh, are very different from, application, from what application originally submitted. So the point of this slide is that the IF stack in this configuration is very deep and the requests change significantly by the time they actually hit the storage. So let me now talk about the experimental setup. So in general, previously people used to use physical setup. This is an application uh, runs in a physical machine and physical machine acts as an NFS or Samba client. And an NAS appliance is just an NFS server, for example, with some uh, scalable backend file systems such as GPFS, Waffle, or ZFS. Nowadays, applications are run within virtual machines, and virtual machines are aggregated on a single powerful co-hypervisor machine uh, that acts as an NFS client for the same network appliance, however. So workload W1 and W2 that enter the NAS appliance, they are not the same. And the current benchmarks generate workload W1 by, while the one that we have creating, generate workload W2. So just to demonstrate that these workloads are actually different, uh, SPEC SFS 2008 generates 72% of metadata operations, create, read, lookup, and such. However, in a virtual setup, you, want, you almost won't see any uh, metadata operations. So what are the ways to evaluate VMNAS IOSTAC performance? Uh, one way is to run old benchmarks in VMs, but in this case, you need to set up every hypervisor, every VM, uh, install operating systems in them, and applications. And every time when you add, when you want to evaluate a slightly different configuration, for example, a uh, larger number of VMs, you need to do this operation again and again. In certain cases, you actually want to evaluate NAS, you evaluate your NAS against a large number of VMs, like 100, and you might not even have a machine to run so many VMs at the moment, so it becomes impossible or too expensive. So the best way is to actually create new benchmarks that will be able to do the same operation without deploying all this complex infrastructure. So this is the IOSTEC, this is the configuration uh, that I showed earlier, but zoomed in. So for the beginning, we looked only at a single virtual machine and an application running in it, and as you can see, we can actually set up these layers in many different ways. For example, we need to, set, to select an application that runs in the virtual machine. In this study, we selected Filebench and several personalities of it. And also, we used JetStress. Virtual machine, you can set up in many different ways again. You can use different operating system, different file system, and other parameters. In this study, we used both Linux and Windows and XT3 and NTFS file systems. And all other parameters we tried to keep to the default values. The intuition behind that was that this is probably quite a common case in reality. You can use different hypervisors, ESX, KVM, Xen, and all of them also have a number of parameters. Again, uh, we tried to keep all of the parameters to default and used ES6.5. Uh, the nice appliance in our study is a completely black box, so we don't really care is it a IBM's filer or NetApp's filer. Uh, in this specific study, the backend file system was GPFS. That's because our crystal ball showed that it will get a test of a time award at FAST. <laughs> there, here it is. So now let me talk a little bit about the workload characterization. So this table summarizes the changes that we observed, immediate changes. So first of all, file system tree changes significantly. Uh, if in physical setup you usually see uh, deep, non-uniform trees with a lot of small files, in, in a virtual setup, 
you see only few large and sparse files in the very uniform directories. So if you are designing your NAS for future, for virtual workloads, this is the case for which you need to uh, optimize them. Another change, which I already mentioned, is that in physical setup, you see quite many metadata operations. In the virtual setup, you don't see any of the metadata operations. Well, just a few. The reason for that is because imagine when you create a file in the virtual machine, it actually translates to a sequence of write to the block layer in the, in the guest OS. And then hypervisor actually translates these writes to the writes, to the NFS writes, to the NAS. And the same happens to stats, to lookups, and so on and so forth. So again, maybe it doesn't make sense to optimize for metadata uh, workloads. IO synchronizations, if previously uh, writes were both synchronous and asynchronous, then in virtual setups, all writes have a sync flag on them. So, and this happens because the hypervisor tries to emulate the block layer semantic. And we know that many filers used to use this flag to perform certain optimizations. So now all of that optimizations are actually becoming useless. Uh, this is a known one. The randomness in the file increases significantly uh, because now you have multiple processes accessing different parts of a, v of a VDI file and uh, producing in total a very random access pattern. On the other hand, the cross-file cross -file randomness actually decreases. It is very easy to predict which file will be accessed and which not based on the state of a virtual machine. IO sizes change depending on how the layers stream or merge the requests. And we also observe uh, more read and modify writes uh, in case of a virtual setup. Uh, you can find more details on that in the paper. And think time, if you have an overlaid hypervi overloaded hypervisor with many VMs, the think time also increases. So after looking at these observations, we uh, decided to just characterize the virtual workload using some well-known characteristics. So we looked at the read-write ratio, IO size distribution, jump distance, and jump distance is just an LBN distance between two consecutive requests. Uh, and also at the offset reuse, how often the same offsets are overwritten or read again. So just to demonstrate you a couple of slides, uh, a couple of results, uh, on this graph on the x-axis is the workload that we tried, and on the y-axis is the percent of reads for green bar and writes for the red bar. So for three of the workloads, web server, database server, and mail server, the ratio actually remained pretty similar to what we observed in the physical setup. But for the file server, it actually changed because of the, a lot of the metadata operations translated into the reads and the ratio shifted. Uh, on the top slide on this graph, you see the IO size distribution. On the x-axis is the IO size in kilobytes. On the y-axis is the percents of the request that had corresponding IO size. And this graph specifically for web server workload. Uh, we did it uh, separately for reads and writes. And what you can see, first of all, all of the IO sizes were within 64 kilobyte boundary. And this is the limitation of the, uh, that NFS server actually posed on the writes. Secondly, you can see this um, curve uh, that describes the pattern of how reads and writes uh, were arranged. And the reason behind that is because the files were create the file sizes that a web server uses were, uh, uses this distribution. Also, you can see that peak in the end for the writes, and the reason that why you see it for writes but you don't see it for reads because many writes are accumulated in RAM and then later are written out by the PD flash and are accumulated in larger chunks, which are later chunked by already the NFS server, as earlier I've said. On the second graph in the middle is the CDF distribution for the jump distance for database server. So on the x-axis is the jump distance in gigabytes. On the y-axis is the percents of the requests with this jump distance. And you can see this uh, step in the middle and it is within two gigabytes because that was the size of the workload used by the database server. So most of the jumps were within that uh, data set. However, we also see jumps to the beginning of the disk and that's uh, because of the database server does sync operation which causes to write the metadata. Finally, on the bottom graph is the access reuse. 
So on the x-axis is the number of times some offset was accessed, and on the y-axis, the percent of the, time, the percent of requests that were accessed with the corresponding number of times. So you can see that reads almost universally were accessing uh, some offset only once. However, for writes, well, some of the offsets were overwritten twice, thrice, and so on and so forth, uh, which was kind of interesting. So how did we create the benchmarks? Uh, we actually use our older T2M converter. Uh, it operates as following. We collect the trace, we perform the chunking. Uh, this is basically just uh, splitting the trace in fixed uh, uh, chunks. After that, we, from every chunk, we were extracting a workload features uh, described earlier and putting them in the multi-dimensional histogram. Since many of the chunks actually exhibit very similar workload, uh, we did the duplication to create a smaller models. And then we were, uh, we were translating these um, this histograms into our benchmarks language. In this case, we used FileBench. So we needed to modify this, however, because uh, previously we applied it to the block layer to the block traces. So first of all, first change that we observed is that uh, since we used benchmarks, not the real traces, uh, there were not that much variance in the workload. So chunking was not that useful except that we needed to eliminate the initial state at which benchmark was uh, creating a lot of files. And the second thing is that it was a block traces before, and now it was NFS traces. But as I m mentioned already, this is basically a block on file. So we didn't need to emulate metadata operations. So using this converter, we converted it to FileBench language. Uh, you can find details in the paper. But I would just like to demonstrate one feature of our benchmarks that I think is extremely helpful. So you can see on this slide how we define the hypervisor of E6 type. And within that hypervisor, we define five virtual machines of type file server and two virtual machines of type web server. So by adding more and more definitions into this description, you can actually mix any number of different VMs and can benchmark your NAS against any combination, any mix of VMs, which I think is a very far powerful feature. So now we, we need to evaluate the accuracy of the benchmarks. And we did it in the following way. We first run non-virtualized benchmark in VM and collected a number of uh, parameters at NAS, reads per second, writes per second, and so on, 11 in total. And then we did the same for the virtualized benchmark without deploying any of the infrastructure. And again, collected the parameters and compared them. So on this slide, on the x-axis, you see the parameter, that we, the accuracy parameter described earlier. And on the y-axis is the, percent, the, the, the error in percents. Uh, the red bar represents maximum error, and uh, the green one is RMS. And this is for a single VM for web server. And you can see that maximum error was within 10%, while RMS was within 7%, which is a remarkably, remarkably good accuracy. But obviously, we would like to see that this accuracy scales to multiple VMs. So we performed the following experiment. Um, we were adding more and more VMs to the definition. Uh, on the x-axis in this graph is the number of VMs. And we were mixing different VMs. So we were adding always uh, different VM than the previous one. And on the y-axis is also the error in percents. And different lines represent different accuracy metric. It's kind of hard to understand you know, how it behaves, but this red uh, thick curve in the middle is an average. And you can see that, on average, our accuracy remained almost within 8%, and it actually does not grow rapidly. So our, our benchmarks scale pretty well to multi-VM workloads. So let me now conclude. Um, virtualization actually causes NAS workloads to change. And current benchmarks do not generate representative workloads for virtualized environments. There is a clear need for such benchmark. And we did the first step by converting the traces, uh, by collecting the traces in virtualized environment and converting them to the benchmarks. And the accuracy of our benchmarks is within 10% on average. In the future, we would like to explore different configurations of VM NASA ISTEC because current benchmarks are tightly coupled to the configurations we selected.
And when we have enough uh, results, we would like to classify and see how different parameters of BMNAS IO stack affect the resulting workload. Uh, we would also like to play with VM specific workloads, such as snapshotting or boot and update storms. And finally, to make our benchmarks really flexible, we would like to make them uh, modular so that you can select a module for different guest file system, for XT3, for NTFS, and basically assemble a benchmark as a Lego. Uh, this will give us a very high flexibility, and we plan to do it using a multi-level trace analysis. Uh, thank you. We will release the benchmarks. You can Google uh, this string TTM public, and the first hit will actually lead, it to, lead you to our page, or there is a URL in the paper which you should follow. Thank you. Hi. Uh, nice paper. So uh, my name is Chaitanya uh, from Symantec. Um, is there anything uh, in this paper that cannot be used for SAN? So for example, can I use this to evaluate uh, why uh, to make a case for SAN for virtualized uh, environments? Yes, potentially. So the same technique can be applied. Our benchmarks cannot be directly applied to SAN uh, because you know we did it for NAS. But the technique itself can be applied for SAN, and it also depends. You know, I'm talking about the configuration when you run a clustered file system like VMFS on top of SAN. Right, yes. Oh, about this case? Right. Uh, the, in this case, you actually can use it directly. As long as we have a file system interface, then you can do it, yes. Uh, I had a quick question. Uh, Kiran Reddy from Amazon. Uh, so I see that you use the completely fair queue scheduler uh, in the VM. And you know, given that at the end of the day, the workload is random, maybe I would have used new the no op scheduler. So I'm just curious to wonder if changing the scheduler at the VM level will, will make any difference or are or, or the meta points that you take ever stay the same? Yeah, right. So this is what I mentioned in the future work. We don't know right now how the configuration of specific layer and IO scheduler is just one example affects the resulting workload. Uh, we want to experiment with more different configurations and basically de do something like a clustering analysis and understand which parameter actually affects the resulting workload and which are less, influ less influential. Cool. Thanks. Let's thank, let's thank the speaker. Thanks. Thank you.